Hello? It should work in there. I'm the executive director of Stockholm Environment Institute. I will not welcome you. I will immediately instead introduce Jacob Granit, who is the center director of the Stockholm Environment Institute, for some opening words. Jacob, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
bring out issues for all, all of us, for future learning. So finally, uh, the outcome of this event then is really about shared learning and brainstorming of ideas of action to promote change towards cl climate smart sustainable development. So with that, I would like to invite our co-organizers just to say also a few words of welcome. So Nina Eklund, please, from the Haga Initiative, which is a business network, please. Thank you, Jakob. So lovely to see everyone here. I'm representing a business network, the Haga Initiative, and the vision is a profitable business sector without climate impact. And today's seminar, Corporate Choices in a Changing, cli changing Climate, that's very interesting. And one of the questions that we will ask here today is, how are companies incorporating climate change information into their business sector today. To help companies with this task, I think there is two strategies. And it's a, the not a lonely ranger strategy, and it's the not geek strategy. And the not lunar strategy is about cooperation. Cooperation today, policy, business, science, civil society need to transfer Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're moving the my people presentation. Here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, need to transfer uh, knowledge between these groups. And the other strategy uh, is about adaptation or adapt information. First, I wrote simplify information, but maybe someone will get shivers about that. So to adapt the information so the business sector feels targeted. And I think these two strategies, the not not two strategies, uh, is very important. And I think that's what we why we're here today, and what we're trying to do here today also. So I hope everyone feels uh, this will be a great day. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nina. Uh, that was the business uh, angle of it. And now we'd like to invite Sasha Beslik from Nordea, who represents the investor angle of today's topic. Please. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. We are so happy to be able to support this, and thanks to Stockholm Environmental Institute and all the efforts, and also Haga Initiative. Uh, one of the reasons why we think this is important is that we do have a choice as the investors, and we do have a choice as a company to invest and create returns in a more sustainable way. The choice is not about um, doing things that in a short term will generate big returns. The choice is actually to be long-term oriented, create returns over the period of time, that, and actually build societies that we live in. We are bank with a, we're the biggest Nordic bank, we are biggest Nordic asset manager, we have 12 million clients, and we have a huge amount of capital that is invested every day all over the world. Being a financial player is also being a global citizen because the financial industry is probably one of the few truly global citizens because we transfer money from one part of the world to another in a basically matter of seconds. We believe that uh, interaction with the environmental institutes, with the business organization is key. We strongly need information. We need to understand the impacts and we need to understand how we can address that in an investment context so we can create not only returns but also sustainable development, which we believe is core for any business next 10, 15 years. I think it's, a, it's going to be a very interesting day, and I think that the setup is fantastic, so please enjoy, and let's see how, how it ends up. Thank you. Great, Sasha. Thank you so much. It seems we are already on, have started the seminar, and you want, please, back to your safe hands to guide us through the days. Thank you, Jacob. Why don't we give them an applaud? That's So we have the framing of this day, and as you could hear from Jacob, we have a very full day. I will be very honest, the first part here, it will not be a lot of time for discussions and questions and so on, because we have a number of very interesting presentations in limited time. Uh, however, we have the long discussion sessions, so questions coming up, ideas and so on, should be brought into these discussions. Um, so you then after also the, the session, the discussion session, we can take them back also in the final panel and when we have Peter Nurman here as well. 
the Minister for Financial Markets. So please note down questions, ideas, comments, and bring them to the discussions. I don't want to waste more time when we have the key people here in the room who really sits on the science that will be presented over the course of the year, actually. Uh, I would like to introduce, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Pauline Midgley, please, if you can come up on stage. You know, this is not just any person. This is a person who is here to launch the first IPCC uh, report, the science. Uh, and she dedicates one hour to us here, so we should be very appreciative for that. Your title is Head Working Group at One Technical Support Unit. So we are very curious to hear how you see some of the things coming out of the IPCC <coughs> report. The science may be of interest also for industry. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very honored to have been invited to, to come here. Shall I get my first slide now? I'm not sure. Anyway. It's uh, too technical, this. Yeah, it's, very, it's very technical. Yeah, that's right. I'll just stand here. Here we go. Okay. So you see a very fine Norwegian glacier. What you see here is, in fact, the, uh, I hope not tempting fate, it's going to be the cover of the Working Group 1 contribution to the fifth assessment report. I say tempting fate because the summary for policymakers of that report is going to be approved by governments here, meeting here in Stockholm from Monday to Thursday next week. So the report will be launched actually on Friday. So the title that I was given was What Can Businesses Expect? And I have to say, I hope you don't expect me to tell you that because everything is under embargo <laughs> until next Friday. Um, having said that, um, and also talking to Richard Klein, who's going to be talking afterwards, one of the things we felt that was useful probably, um, in fact, for many audiences, not just businesses, is to actually get a feel for what's different about IPCC. Why should you listen to IPCC rather than the other brand? Um, what is it that IPCC does that makes it unique? And essentially what IPCC does, it doesn't do its own research, it doesn't do its own science, it stands as the intergovernmental panel on climate change. Intergovernmental is really important. And the intergovernmental panel um, over the last 25 years has now had, just coming into its fifth assessment cycle, with an assessment of scientific literature on climate change issues on the whole range of the climate change program, if you like, or, or problem. Um, almost the mantra of IPCC is it's going to produce reports that are policy relevant but not policy prescriptive. They're intended by the governments of the world to feed into the policy process. If the policy process chooses not to do anything with those answers, that's also the government's issue, but they've got a different hat on at that point. Um, they have to be scientifically and technically robust. They have to be balanced. Comprehensive and balanced is you know, two of our things. They must present uncertainties. They can't just say, well, this is what's happening, and uh, oh, well, there's some other stuff, but we don't worry about it. They really have to look at the whole picture. So the IPCC has this structure. It has parent organizations, which are WMO and UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme. The IPCC plenary, which you see at the top, is effectively the governments of the world. 195 governments are members of IPCC. They can come to the meetings. I think we currently have 115 coming next week. Um, there is a very small secretariat. The IPCC Bureau is um, our expert scientists uh, of high standing in their countries who are elected by the governments to oversee the process of an, an assessment report. And the current assessment report, as many before it, has effectively three main parts. It has three working groups, which are Working Group 1, which I represent, which is the physical science basis of climate change. It has Working Group 2, which looks at climate change impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, and Working Group 3, which looks at the mitigation of climate change. So you can say that, if you like, Working Group 1 provides the fundamental basis, and Working Groups 2 and 3 hopefully provide some ideas of solutions without actually prescribing solutions, but they present what the solutions might be, whether adaptation or mitigation. There's also, very importantly, this task force on national greenhouse gas inventories, which essentially works very closely with the UNFCCC in helping governments report their emissions, which is an, an important part of that. But the fundamental basis of IPCC is the bottom line. It's not all the top stuff. It's actually the people at the bottom. It's the authors, the contributors, the reviewers. It's this massive number of people around the world who really put um, a lot of time into, into doing this. So this is, you know, the boring bit. These are the principles governing the IPCC work. It has many clauses, many things, but the two things which I really want to emphasize is that 
The role of the IPCC is assessing on a comprehensive, objective, open and transparent basis the scientific, technical and socioeconomic information that's relevant to understanding the basis of, of the risk of human-induced climate change, its options, its impacts and options for adaptation and mitigation, but that they are neutral with respect to policy. So the three working groups, um, as I say, I've run through that very quickly. Basically, in this current cycle, uh, which actually started in 2000 and, uh, 2008 with the election of the Bureau, 2009 really the start of the work of the scientists. Working with one is assessing this physical science basis and we will be releasing our report in seven days' time. Uh, working Group 2, which looks at vulnerability, impacts and adaptation, has until March 2014. One of the reasons for that gap, if you like, is so that the, the fundamental climate modelling results which are assessed in Working Group 1 can be taken forward into working groups two and three, so that they can base their, their assessments on the most up-to-date climate modelling. Working group three comes out very quickly after working group uh, two in April 2014. And then there is a synthesis report, which brings together contributions from all three of these working groups. And that will be released in just over a year from now, in October 2014, actually coincidentally in Copenhagen. Uh, these are, <laughs> in a flash, the IPCC Working Group 1 reports to date, just to show you that we have a, a history started in 1990, went through, um, the most recent one was the, uh, the special report that we did with Working Group 2 on extreme events. The elements of the Working Group 1 assessment report, besides this very fancy cover, is a large amount of information. Uh, there are 14 chapters, there are annexes, there's supplementary information. Um, in those 14 chapters, we actually look at the, um, we start off by the observations. What can we observe, whether it's in the atmosphere, the ocean, terrestrial systems, in terms of what are we observing now? Has temperature changed? Has um, the water cycle changed? And so on. We then go into, from those observations, can we detect a change? And can we attribute that change to human influence? And following on from that, we then have, through the climate modelling, the projections. And we do near-term projections, we do long-term projections, we do regional and global projections. And this time around, we actually have a, a relatively innovative feature, which I think is going to be very useful, um, which is to uh, have an atlas of the regional and global, ob global observations and projections, so that people can actually take that atlas and look for their region, their business markets, the places they want to export to, what's the likelihood of climate change for their supply chains and, and everything else. That's an enormous amount of work. So then there is a technical summary, which brings that down to a smaller basis. And then we have the summary for policymakers, which is exactly what we're going to be looking at next week with the governments, which is about 30 pages at the moment and uh, has nine oh. figures. Um, and that will be approved by the governments line by line. So they literally go through it absolutely. And that literally, um, when you first hear that, you think they, are, they don't really mean that, surely. But they actually do mean that. They take you know, line by line. Introduction. This is a report. It can take a while discussing, you know, well, can we call this a report? Do we want to call it an assessment? But it, and so it goes on. Um, and it's actually a very strong process because what happens is that the, uh, everything that's in that summary for policymakers has to be consistent with the underlying very large assessment. So you'll read in the press, you hear people say, oh, the governments have come to Stockholm to change the summary for policymakers. In a way, they have. They've come to Stockholm to improve it. Um, they want it to be something which actually you can understand. It's not techie jargon like I would write if I was you know, left to my own devices. It's, it's something that they can take and say, that actually means a certain thing. Um, and our citizens can understand that. Our businesses can understand that. So the uh, intention is to improve it, to slim it down, to make it more focused, but only to the extent that the authors, who will also be present, we have about 50 authors with us here in Stockholm, at some point, the co-chair, in going through this discussion, will say, authors, can you go that far? Can you go any further? And they will say, this far and no further. And usually the government say, OK, then. Then that's as far as it goes, because they understand too. It has to be based on the assessment underneath it. So this is just a sort of schematic of the IPCC process, for want of a better word, um, where I've tried to show three lines, which is the on the left-hand side, the scientific community, in the middle, the author team, and on the right-hand side, the government. So the governments are involved right through the process, both in electing the Bureau, in approving the outline of the report, 
in nominating experts, in selecting experts, and then in doing their review. Okay. Um, and so this is where we're going to be. The approval of the summary for policymakers will come along. But the other important thing are these steps of expert review that come on the left-hand side and also government review. So this is a, a well-reviewed report. And here are very quickly the characteristics, most of which I've mentioned. The authors are nominated by governments based on their expertise, um, gender, regional balance, the multiple rounds of review, and then the line-by-line -line approval. Just very, I'm not really going to talk about treatment of uncertainty, I just want to flag that all of you as business people have to take decisions with uncer under uncertainty. So it's, what it's quite important for IPCC to know, uh, to actually describe the uncertainties in their process, um, how you determine it, how you display it, how you formulate it, and how you communicate it. And that's something that IPCC has worked on quite hard in the last few years to try and improve that aspect. We also have another aspect which is important of the use of literature. Um, Assessing all of the literature for Working Group 1, we give priority, if you like, to publish journals of peer-reviewed literature, but it's perfectly acceptable for other, other material to be used, whether it's government reports or even industry reports, as long as the, the quality of that literature can be assured. And it gives then a responsibility to the author teams to actually ensure that quality. So just to almost finish with some facts about our contribution, we have 209 lead authors, 50 review editors from 39 countries. Not just them writing the report, there are 600 authors, contributing authors who've brought in their expertise to write small parts. We have two million, oh, more than two million gigabytes of data which have been assessed from the, which are in the climate models which are then go into the assessment. In the report itself, um, over 9,200 scientific publications are cited more than three quarters of which are new since 2007, which is the last assessment cycle. So this is an up-to-date report. It went through a very large review process, many expert reviewers from many countries plus governments. We had 54,677 <laughs> review comments, essentially all of which have to be addressed in, in one way or another. And it will be approved in September 2013. So with that, this is our website. Uh, you can, f If you look at that, follow it, you will see the summary for policymakers, hopefully, well before this time next Friday. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, Rachel, while you sort of yep. start off, can I, can I just ask one sure. quick, because you mentioned also in the end the fact that, that uh, you, know, you can use other, other material mm -hmm. than just peer-reviewed mm -hmm. sure. journal articles, even mm -hmm. from business reports and yeah. so on. Mm -hmm. Can you give one example of that, possibly? Uh, a type of, of material that Absolutely. you have used? Absolutely, yes. Uh, because I, uh, in one of my previous incarnations, I worked for the chemical industry. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the things which I brought into the first, second, and third assessment reports were emission data for CFCs. Mm. Um, these were, this was of course, you know, shows how old I am. That's back when there were CFCs. Um, and that's one of the things which only industry had that information. Mm. Um, it was deemed by the author team to be high enough quality information to be used, mm. but it came from a source which was not at all peer-reviewed. Okay. And just yes. finally, I mean, mm -hmm. very impressive to see all these reviewers and yes. so on. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any statistics, if you look at it, how much impact or how much reviews do you get from the business sector? Do they um, read the drafts? They do, they mm -hmm. do. I would say, w I mean, working group one, probably less so, less, but we do yeah. have, uh, you know, obviously scientists from a number of companies. Uh, there have in the past been um, scientists from companies on the, well, as I was myself, as I say, um, but that really is very, actually few for working group one, but mm. for the other working groups, obviously many more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Really nice to have you here, and we Thank know you. that you have a busy week mm -hmm. ahead of you, so we appreciate <laughs> Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Richard Klein, a senior research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute and also uh, a contributing lead author, isn't it, to Working Group 2, which will be launched next year. We expect that you get much more grey hair, you know, in the next six months. Give us some background to that, please. If there's any left, sir. Yes, exactly. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Joanna. Thanks, thanks everyone for, uh, for coming here and, and thanks for the invitation to share something about the importance to read IPCC reports not only as a state of science but also as an input to, to policy and decision making. 
Um, Pauline already briefly mentioned the UNFCCC, and, and I don't know, in our working group, they say don't use acronyms without explaining them, so I'll, I'll do that right now. The, the UNFCCC is the climate treaty, as it was agreed in 1992 at the Earth Summit in, in Rio. It's one of three global treaties, and it's still ongoing. It's still operational, and it, countries meet every year uh, to discuss uh, progress and, and next steps, and this year it will be in Warsaw in, in November. The ultimate objective of that global climate treaty uh, is to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system, whichever that means, but that was the sentence on which they could agree back in 1992. Mm. Um, one way of putting it, and these are not my words, but I think they, they resonate very well, is there are basically two ways of, of looking at the climate problem. Um, first of all, we need to avoid those impacts that are unmanageable. But we also know that there are some impacts that might be unavoidable, and we need to make sure to manage those. And there are two ways of, of looking at that. That's both from the UNFCCC, but it's also how the IPCC is structured. As Pauline said, working group two, dealing primarily with impacts and adaptation, and working group three, dealing with mitigation. So what do these two terms actually mean? First of all, um, there are, up the top there, the human interference that leads to climate change. Um, has an effect on companies, on countries, on citizens through certain impacts and vulnerabilities that may be apparent. Two types of policy responses at the bottom. The first one, to try and actually directly reduce human interference with the climate system, that means reducing the emissions or capturing them in sinks such as forests or, or underground. That's, that's mitigation, that's the prevention side of, of, of the climate equation. Then on the right, there is adaptation to the actual impacts and vulnerabilities that can no longer be avoided. And that's the part that I'm primarily working on, on, on in working group two. And that is, if, if, if you like the medical metaphor, the cure part of it. So prevention is better than cure, but at the same time, they're both needed because we know that we can't avoid all the impacts of climate change anymore. So in terms of IPCC, that means working group one is really dealing with the, the basis of, of that climate of the climate problem, the physics of, of climate change, the basis of that. Working Group 2 looks at that very large part of impacts, vulnerabilities, and adaptation. And Working Group 3 looks at uh, the mitigation side. So what are the options to reduce emissions? Uh, what would be the costs and benefits of that? Um, the IPCC, as I said, is very important in informing not only the scientific community, uh, but the international climate process as well. And it's, it's, a, it's a very nice parallel between the publication of the various assessment reports and how they are then being picked up uh, and how they feed into the international policy process. So the first assessment report came out in 1990. That was before the UNFCCC uh, was agreed, but the negotiations on the UNFCCC were already ongoing. So that was a very important input into what then became the UNFCCC in Rio in 1992. The second assessment report came out in 1995, which was two years before agreement was reached on the Kyoto Protocol in 1997. Then the third assessment report came out in 2001, and that very same year, uh, the Marrakesh Accords were agreed at, at the annual meeting at that year in, in, in Marrakesh. Uh, two things were important there. One was how to make the Kyoto Protocol operational, particularly the flexible mechanisms in there, but also the notion of adaptation, which until that moment was really not a very strong part of both the IPCC reports and the UNFCCC, because the idea was prevention is better than cure, and also the idea was that if we start looking at adaptation, that might actually distract us from the importance of, of mitigation, but particularly developing countries that, that were vulnerable and, and were arguing that they were already uh, experiencing the first impact, emphasized the importance of adaptation, and that was clearly in the IPCC third assessment report and therefore also in the Marrakesh Accords. Um, then 2007, a number of things happened in 2007, one of which was the IPCC fourth assessment report, but there was also, and for the first time, the UN Security Council talked about climate change. There was the G8 meeting in Heiligendam where climate change was an important issue. There was Al Gore's film, there was the Stern Review. Uh, it was basically the year that climate change moved from the science pages of the newspapers to the front page. And, and despite difficult uh, political uh, constellations at that time in the White House and China and others, there was agreement in Bali in 2007 in the form of a Bali action plan. It was basically agreement to reach agreement two years later in Copenhagen, which didn't quite work out. Um, what happened over time, from the first until the fourth assessment report, was that many 
more issues than just climate or energy became important. And this is a diagram actually from the time of Copenhagen that showed that this climate change building that is under construction doesn't just have the roof of adaptation and mitigation. There are many layers of issues that one wouldn't necessarily think of as being important to climate change or at least being directly relevant to climate policy. But of course they are issues of law and governance, of, of economics, of society, the science, of course, all underpinning it. But then there are, uh, I don't know if you can read it in the back, but there's a whole bunch of other issues. Uh, the, the issue of ethics and values, um, commodification of carbon, uh, soils, and, and so on. That it, it's a fascinating picture that just shows how complicated negotiations have become, and therefore also how complex the demand on science and research has become uh, that the IPCC needs to consider. So right now we are working on the IPCC fifth assessment report. The work of one contribution will hopefully be uh, available next week. Uh, working with two, as Pauline said, is a little bit slower. The idea is that this will indeed, again, feed into uh, the international climate policy process with possibly an agreement in Paris in 2015. So that, that's sort of the background of how IPCC influences or, or, or feeds into, knowledge of the IPCC feeds into the uh, the policy process. Now, of course, we're here also to look at um, the role of, of business and the importance of that information to to business. And, and it strikes me, this is just off the top of my head, and, and, and I may not be complete here at all, but there are four important aspects or, or roles of, of business vis-a-vis -vis climate change and climate policy. First of all, and, and we know that, and this has been hammered into you from the very beginning, there is, of course, a joint responsibility to try and control emissions. And, and, and many governments or many companies are, are taking that very seriously uh, through the uh, Carbon Disclosure Project and others are really taking uh, a, a close look at their emissions and, and how they can become more efficient. Of course, the idea being that that's not only good for climate, it's good for the budget sheet as well of the company. The second, increasingly, companies are realizing that not only perhaps do, are they part of the, of the problem, they are also um, experiencing climate risk themselves. So maybe your production facilities are in floodplains or, or maybe the people who work at the company might be affected by climate change. Uh, uh, maybe your supply chains will be affected by climate risk. Um, there are opportunities uh, arising from climate change, um, both in, in mitigation and uh, adaptation, whether that's green tech, whether that's water technology and so on. There's a long list of, of possible opportunities. Uh, and uh, then finally, the idea that not only government finance, but also private finance can contribute to climate action in developing countries. Uh, again, there would be a return on investment like all of these issues, of course. Um, my colleagues are going to talk much more about this in the, in the next few presentations, so, so I'll, I'll just leave this here as a teaser. Thank you very much. Thank you. And while I can ask Marion maybe to come up and prepare herself, and she's sending Twitter, I'm sure, because there is a lot of people who, if you don't Twitter, you don't exist. I'm s I feel sorry for them in a way, don't you? Huh? Yeah. Anyway, so uh, the Twitter is uh, hashtag climbbiz. Climbbiz. Okay, so anyone who wants to send that. But Richard, while she's setting this up, really interesting, very good with these questions also, highlighting. Not least that, okay, you have responsibilities as business, but there are opportunities as well. Can you say in a few words how is business getting involved in, in um, the second report, in working group two? We are perhaps even more so than working group oops, yeah. as in, yes. Even more so than working group one, we are certainly looking at um, the role in which, uh, the way in which business um, can both contribute to, to adaptation, but also in the way in which they, they are impacted. There's one chapter that uh, deals explicitly with the impact and vulnerabilities of industry to climate change. Mm. Um, there are several chapters that look at um, different aspects of adaptation. Uh, again, there are there, there's mm. business literature out there that we are assessing. So it, there is not partic one particular spot that sort of deals with all the issues of, of industry and business. I would say through all of Working Group 2 and Working Group 3, there are parts uh, mm. of the assessment that are relevant. Okay, do you, do you see, in, because you've been involved also, like you, Pauline, of course, quite a long time with the IPCC. Uh, do you see an increasing interest in general from business sector? 
Yes, I, I, I think the, the quest for assessment reports, really the interest was from governments. The, the mandate of the IPCC is to inform governments, yeah. and there wasn't really that much public interest in what the IPCC had been saying. I think since the fourth assessment report, that has changed very much. Both the private sector, but also the public sector, um, governments at all levels, uh, NGOs, are taking real interest in what the IPCC has to say. And I think a conference like this is, is uh, you know, demonstrates that that interest mm. is, is growing. Thank you very much. How many people in here represent business? You see, it's great. That's what we wanted today. You're not that anyone else is not the welcome. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> you know, how many are here from more government uh, type? I see one. I see a few. Good. And uh, civil society outside of business? A couple. Great. Just to get a feeling. And you are all equally welcome. And I wanted to have that question because it's sort of flows over to Marion Davis. So thank you very much, uh, Richard. Marion, uh, communication manager also at the Stockholm Environment uh, Institute. Um, looking at since the last uh, IPCC report, your, your question is how have corporate views on climate change evolved? So please, um, the floor is yours. Am I actually audible? Yes. Yes. Um, so this initiative was started in 2007, and the first big project that we did was looking at how to drive technological innovation. We were looking at uh, solar photovoltaics and at carbon capture and storage. Um, I think everybody's familiar with both, but basically, you know, solar power, one particular way of doing solar power, and then supposedly the way that the, the technology that's going to allow us to clean up emissions from power plants. Um, then the next project that we did was this multifaceted project on resource constraints because, as you probably know, there are many different reasons why resources, you know, resources, we, we don't have unlimited water, we do not have unlimited biomass, we do not have unlimited metals for specific, pro uh, for, for specific technologies. And in some cases, for example, with the metals in particular, you have only a few countries, and not necessarily the most democratic or the best run countries, are the ones that have these metals. So there's a lot of uh, concerns about resource scarcity affecting the ability of technologies to, to advance. Um, it's also very interesting that you know, nobody thinks of water as being a constraint for, um, for green energy, but it is as well. So for example, solar thermal, which is a wonderful technology that y it works really, really well in the deserts and inconveniently needs water. So, um, and then the last project that we did is on international trade and greenhouse gas emissions. And it's this idea that we have a globalizing economy where more and more production is being directed to the places where it is most cost effective to produce. And what we asked was what would happen if not just, if we didn't just direct tra uh, production to the countries that are cheapest, but also the countries that are most energy efficient and that are most uh, low carbon in their production. And um, I don't know, I don't think one of the authors is here, but one of the really, you know, difficult findings of this is that, of course, you got, you know, to the extent that you are from business, businesses have a lot of choice in where you produce. There's relatively little that policy can do to steer that. Um, but it is definitely an area where we saw that there's a lot of potential for businesses to start thinking about the emissions intensity of production because it makes, you know, and I'm sorry, I don't have my, I thought I was going to have access to my notes and I don't, but, you know, sometimes there's a tenfold difference, for example, between the emissions associated with making a pair of jeans in one country versus in another. Um, so those are the big 3C projects. Um, the last thing that we did was we did a sort of an overview report in which we looked at how things had changed since we started out. And uh, we surveyed 3C companies. We also looked at um, corporate social responsibility reports for major corporations that were already involved in the carbon disclosure 
project. So these were not just random companies, but there were companies that had already showed some interest in climate issues. And we also just looked at what businesses were talking about in general. And uh, the key finding that we found is that, you know, when we started out, the whole thing about 3C was to a great extent to have business push for a global climate deal. And, you know, back in 2007, that was sort of the, the view that we were going to make it. And as, as Richard said, you know, like, there was going to be a deal by Copenhagen, surely. And then we didn't get one. And what has happened is that businesses have gradually moved away from thinking of that as a priority, and relatively few are still pushing that. And instead, what they have done is they've moved more to the domestic level, to their own countries, or their own regions, or their own states. And they have also increasingly internalized it. And this is where we had this really great synthesis of it by one of the people that we interviewed. We have this contradiction in the public debate, climate change is lacking traction because of the failure of Copenhagen, the financial situation, and he also named a few other issues. But in the meantime, climate change is more and more internalized by businesses. So this means actually this is the core of what we're here to talk about today, which is exactly what does it take for businesses to start thinking of climate change as something that is not something nice that they do out of the goodness of their hearts, but essential to their operations. So one of the things that we asked businesses is what motivates them. And we found that the single thing that motivated them the most was still cost savings. If it happens to make their lives cheaper to somehow do mitigation, then they do it. Ironically, we also found research that shows that businesses that are motivated by cost savings do the least of it uh, in terms of, you know, do, do the least mitigation. And the other thing that we found that was very interesting is that more and more consumers are demanding this. And, um, you know, to the extent that companies see more opportunities to do well by doing good, they're doing it. Am I running out of time? One minute. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> the other thing that we found, the fastest growing thing that we found, motivator that we found was investor pressure. We have a lot of investors asking both for c businesses to disclose climate risks and also to increasingly show that they're not harming the environment. And we found that uncertainty is a very big issue. Um, a lot of companies don't really know what's going to happen both in the business world and in policy. And that is something that a lot of them are told us we're very concerned about. Um, I'm going to have to skip this because I have a lot of different things. But these reports are outside and we're also going to have them on USBs. But we show, I mean, businesses are doing quite a few different things from talking to their suppliers to changing their own processes and they're looking at both mitigation and adaptation. Um, the other thing that we found that was very interesting, and this was both expressed in the interviews we had and also in the research we saw, is that increasingly businesses don't think of climate change as something in the future. They think of it as something now. And that actually will you know, lead very well into what Gregor will present in a moment, I mean, uh, Magnus will present in a moment. Um, and the other thing is that global, a global economy means that what happens in Thailand can affect you. And, oops, sorry, went too far. Um, I'll leave you with these thoughts. These are the basic, the, the, the main conclusions that we came out of that report with. Great, thank you. Thanks a lot, Marion. Wh uh, Magnus, while you are getting prepared, yes, Mary. I mean, the last one is, is, is quite interesting. And, and what is fascinating in a way is that you say, because there is a bit of a failure on the global arena, actually business are taking more active, you could say, responsibility to seek their own ways right. of trying to address the issue. Yes. So that's one thing that is obviously quite clear in this. Yes, and it, it businesses are, it, it's, it's actually, from, from our perspective, a very smart thing because businesses are starting to realize that it's in their interest to act in many cases for a variety of reasons, not just for ethical reasons, although ethics is an important part. But certainly they understand that uh, to have resilient operations, they mm. need to make sure that they're not, th that they adapt to climate change. Okay, that's thanks. And I saw one of the graphs which was interesting is also more increasingly that they, they try to influence policy as well, themselves, being more active. Right. Which is, of course, also... In their own countries. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Marion. Sorry for pushing you through a little bit. But <laughs> Magnus, uh, Marion also stated the fact that business works more and more in their own supply chain, how to understand the risks and so on. 
This is something you looked into a little bit. So please, Magnus, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, as Marion said, one of the, the themes that we got from the 3C final report was that supply chain issues matter a lot more to businesses these days, but also that they're often poorly understood. So the issue is really this. Your company needs to understand its exposure to climate risk and its climate risk opportunities in its supply chain to be successful in future. That's not an easy task, but it's a very important one. And here we have a picture of Bangkok, which has been already mentioned, and the flooding in 2011. Um, and a figure that Marion mentioned, World Bank estimated um, the cost of that event to be $46 billion in total. Now, if you look further in the background of this picture, you see a Honda factory. And I grew up in the west of England near a big Honda factory in a town called Swindon. That factory was preparing to launch a new Honda model, a Honda Civic, when these floods hit Bangkok. Production at that factory in the UK, thousands of miles away from Thailand, was reduced production to two days a week because they couldn't get critical parts made in this factory in Thailand. And that came in a year that Honda had already seen quarterly profits drop 88% as a result of supply chain disruption this time from the tsunami in Japan. And the impacts on, of the Thailand floods were global. The automotive industry in Japan was producing 6,000 fewer cars every single day as a result of flooding in Thailand. So climate change will bring more frequent and intense floods of the nature that are kind of seen in Bangkok. And climate change will magnify supply chain risks across all sectors. I'll briefly look more now at how. So on the right of the screen up there, you see you, the buyer, at the top of the supply chain. And climate change will impact the price, the availability, and the quality of the inputs to your business. And the more sensitive your inputs are to climate change, the bigger the risks that you face. Climate change will also affect the availability of the, the price and create price shocks in the short term and alter price trends in the long term for commodities and raw materials. In 2012, we saw a crisis in the soybean market, for example, as a result of consecutive droughts in the key producing regions of Brazil and Argentina, and then also in the US in the same year, pus pushing prices to the highest levels they've ev ever been, and that eroded profit margins on producers as far away as China, and the EU. It also had significant impacts um, on low-income con low consumers, and the World Bank uh, food index price rose 10% in response to this soy crisis. We've seen governments increasingly imposing export bans and export restrictions during climate-driven crises. And a key message here is that these droughts didn't just occur in one place. They were systemic. They were systemic system-wide impacts of simultaneous droughts in South America, North America, and also in the e EU at the same time. And climate change produces systemic risks, not just isolated impacts. The location of your suppliers and of their suppliers influences your exposure to climate risk, as the case of the Thailand automotive industry just showed. And wherever your suppliers are located, goods need to be delivered to your sites and transported to markets, and this exposes them to another range of risks. I did some work with the Scotch whiskey industry a few years ago, and one of the risks, maybe unexpected risks there, was in transporting their product to growth markets in the south of Asia. You imagine a whiskey that's been maturing in a cask for over 20 years in a cold warehouse in Scotland is then shipped through tropical Asia where conditions in the container reach over 50 degrees centigrade and high humidity. The cork in the bottle spoils the whiskey, the label peels in the humidity, and you can't sell the bottle of whiskey when it arrives at market. As a proud Scot, I can tell you that's a tragic waste of whiskey, not just a business. <laughs> <laughs> Companies also rely on a steady supply of energy and ICT services and water. And these utilities can all be disrupted by climate change impacts in the short term and increasingly over the long term. 
And that adds a further dimension to your climate risk exposure. Now, the longer and more complex your supply chain, the riskier it is. In supply chain management, people talk of the bullwhip effect, where the peaks and troughs of supply and demand in the supply chain increase the further you move up the supply chain. And climate change will exacerbate that phenomenon, creating bigger risks for longer, more uncertain, more complex supply chains, particularly the kind that characterise modern manufacturing, commodity, the food and drink supply network. Now, the key question for companies is this. How much do you know about the exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity of your suppliers or of your entire supply network? And how can you learn more? Now, it's important to know the answers to, tho to those questions. We're seeing increasing pressure from investors, as has already been mentioned, for companies to disclose their climate risks. The CDP re released their... Um, 2013 report this last week and that report was very critical of companies <laughs> for failing to improve the measurement of climate risk in their supply chains. There's also increasing pressure from regulators. We've seen the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States require information on material risks and climate change in company reporting. And we've also seen experiments with Acts of Parliament that give governments, for example, the UK government, the right to request climate risk information directly from some companies. So a company's attitude and approach to adaptation will be significantly influenced by the structure of their markets and supply chains, and the, crucially the level of interdependence between buyer and supplier. In markets where there's a high number of competing suppliers, dominant buyers will tend to seek to switch suppliers to manage climate risks. For example, when a coffee crop is poor in Tanzania, you seek to buy from producers in Colombia. Now this comes with increasing reputational risk. There was an interesting report from Oxfam this year looking at how companies' climate change adaptation activities and supply chains can affect communities and companies in developing countries. And the key message was that businesses that are seen to abandon climate-affected suppliers will be criticised for exacerbating mm -hmm. the vulnerability mm -hmm. of climate-afflicted communities. Where there's more in independence between interdependence between buyers and suppliers, for example, in small niche supply chains, or where there's a high concentration ratio, meaning buyers that rely on a small number of key suppliers, adaptation options are, are more limited. Companies in these circumstances may seek to increase stockpiles or to move away from just-in-time delivery systems to increase the buffers protecting them from climate risk, maybe even to buy supply chain insurance. Alternatively, or at the same time, companies can choose to invest in the resilience of their suppliers, recognising the shared interest of creating greater resilience in the whole supply network. And an interesting example of this is from PepsiCo in the UK and Ireland. And one of their key food brands, Walker's Crisps was heavily marketed as being produced from 100% British potatoes to meet demand from customers for locally produced food. But that tied the company into that local supply chain. And PepsiCo were noticing varying quality and price of the potato crop in the UK because of changing climate conditions. And in response, they chose to invest directly with their farmers to reduce these risks. And that resulted in a number of contractual changes with their suppliers and investments to increase irrigation at the farm level and to supply farmers with more climate information through mobile phone apps. Now that case highlights that in markets where suppliers and buyers are highly interdependent, it makes business sense to invest in and to work with supply chain partners to manage climate risk. Now I'll leave you with an invitation to share your insights on supply risks and climate change and to benefit from some exciting new research that we're doing at SEI. Through one project, the, the Changing Climate for Business project, we're engaging in participatory research alongside corporate, climate, uh, corporate decision makers in Sweden to look at how current processes and tools can account for climate risk in supply chains. 
looking at enterprise risk management and supply chain risk management and how they're used in the adaptation setting. And together with the consultancy Terrains, we'll be producing guidance for corporate decision makers in that project. And SCI is also looking at important new research and the international dimensions of climate risk. So asking, do climate risks respect national borders? In a hyper-connected world, we need to recognise that impacts overseas affect the economy and the well-being at home. And evidence does not currently support assessments of these indirect effects of climate change. So through the Adaptation Without Borders project, we're leading efforts to clarify what kinds of international risk climate change poses and how adaptation decision-making and risk governance can better take account of those issues. So we welcome your input, and if you'd like to hear um, or contribute to either or both of those projects, uh, please either speak to me or contact SEI after the event. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you have a very interesting and rewarding day. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Magnus. I, I don't think I said that you are a research fellow at SCI, so this is something I say with a lot of proud that you are a research fellow at SCI in Stockholm. So, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. We're going to have actually the panel coming up now. Uh, it's been, you know, a tight schedule, and we've had a lot of interesting inputs. Can I ask the panel members, you're spread out here, just to come up with me here on the, you know, at the floor. There should be a, yeah, there's the microphone. I'm going to use this microphone a little bit, so please come up. I'm going to explain what I'm going to do now. Please, don't be shy. You can stand here in the middle. Maybe we can make this a little bit black. Yes, we could. So uh, I'm going to explain. I'm going to introduce you in a while, but just explain the process. Why are pictures coming back on this? Can you, can you make it black? Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to go around a little bit in the audience for a few minutes just to get a couple of, uh, and can you make this one black also? Thanks. Um, to you know, get a couple of impressions before I introduce you even, uh, to see what they are, you know, what, what is going on in their heads out there. I ask you to take note a little bit of that so you can, in your then uh, interaction, maybe reflect on some of these questions. And, and just to remind the audience that the, the, the theme of this panel is um, do business know enough to act? on climate change. So, you know, you can be a short comment or a question, but short. So I want to have like four or five before I introduce the panel even to give you a chance. So any hands up? Yes? No? 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 Okay. Come on. Where? Oh, up there, of course. Okay. So, someone at the furthest end. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. I like to run. It's Friday. Here you go. And very short, tell us who you are also. Um, Speak loud if it doesn't work, the microphone. Doesn't work. I'm just free. My name is Jakob Lagerkrantz from Gothenburg, focusing on environmental protection and peace policy. And we have now item from Climate Action 6, the fourth item in the report about bringing climate change to us. Continue to try. Just continue. Okay, so that's the fundamental question, really, coming back to our uh, guest on the stage. So, any other insight, comments? I'm, I'm expecting someone from the other end, but no. Okay, the audience are waiting for, uh, obviously, the, I hope this is not a signal how the discussion will be at after the coffee here, but, or not coffee, but if, anyway, uh, shout. Great, that's a very good question. Do we just say it's good for business, and, but it's not really? Or is it really good for business? Anyway, I mean, two quick interactions there. Let me introduce now uh, the panel. Dov uh, Brachfeld, Environmental uh, Sustainability for H&M. Pleased to have you here. 
Mons Nilsson, who is the research director of the Stockholm Environment Institute. We have, we have also Birgitta Resvik, uh, head corporate relations Fortum. And Maria Suner, Fleming Director, Energy and Climate Policies at the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. So we, we finally also have business on stage, a lot from science, okay? We have analyzed you guys. Uh, but still, I'm going to give Mons the first word and, you know, very, very, very shortly answer the questions from your scientific perspective. Does business know enough to act? Mm, uh, yes. And Good. <laughs> or you want to do like Good Morning Världen or should I? You can actually yeah. be more of a politician and yeah. add a couple of things. No, I think um, there, there are many uncertainties mm -hmm. remaining and uh, IPCC will continue to uh, develop and uh, refine the knowledge that is needed to deal with these uncertainties. But we will never know uh, everything. And as we all know, it's impossible to predict the future uh, anyway. So, but businesses can certainly act, and, and they have to act in a way that is robust strategies in a, in a world of, of, of fundamental uncertainty. And that goes for climate change, mm. as well as economic drivers, demographic drivers, and, and so on. Um, so, businesses can act, and it's relating to supply chains, the more robust supply chains, uh, in view of climate vulnerability, but also in terms of diversifying portfolios of products and technologies mm. that go more towards the low carbon uh, pathways. Mm. Um, so my answer is yes. But if I could just ask you one more thing, Mons. Uh, do you, I mean, the fact we, we could hear also from the audience here, they, they at least the sense from the two, if they are representative for all, I don't know, uh, that business is not doing enough and so on. Do you think that if this, if this would be the case, that we still feel business can do more, do we from science have a responsibility in the way we are communicating risks, possibilities, opportunities that business can actually act upon? Yeah, I think we from the research side are not quite doing enough in terms of putting ourselves into the shoes of, of businesses and understanding the questions that they're dealing with. Mm. And this is about, it's not so easy because business leaders may not want to tell you what they actually <laughs> are focusing on in terms of the key decision parameters. But we have to try and understand those better and direct our research efforts so that we can help them answer those questions. Mm. And I think this uh, new work on supply, supply chains is a good example of mm. when we're starting to do that, rather than delivering broad system descriptions that doesn't have any particular relevance for the, for the business decision making, we have to sort of pinpoint better what are the decision points and what kind of knowledge is needed for them to make decisions in this realm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if I could you move to you, Maria, because you, you represent, you could say, the business sector in a way through the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. So you, you have a lot of different sectors, different companies in your entire membership. What, what is your perspective? Do you, do you sense that business knows enough to take more action than what is happening today? Or do you think that there are still a lot of unclarities which makes it difficult for business to know exactly what to do? Well, I have to say, I think I, they know enough, definitely, especially on, on the fact that the climate change is really happening. I don't think there is many people out there in the business community who actually uh, disputes that, is, especially not in Sweden. Um, but uh, to me, I think maybe the discussion around uh, adaptation and, and, for example, this uh, that was pre presented on supply chain uh, risks, I think that is, for me at least, a little bit of a new perspective that maybe it could make more businesses act more on the adaptation and the risks uh, connected to climate change. So I think that that's actually a very good thing to, to try to uh, communicate that better, as you said. I think that's something that many businesses might not really understand what implications th this could have to their business. Hmm. If you take the confederation and, and I mean the similar discussion that our question I had to Mons, what can you more as the collective uh, do to support businesses in, 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 in the work to adapt to climate change but also be more active in mitigation? Can you do, do you play a specific role there? 
Well, of course, you could always do more. I mean, we could inform our members more, we could work more on these issues, but, but I mean, we are a very small organization and I'm the only person working on energy and climate mm. change. <laughs> so <laughs> it's also a limited uh, piece of resources from our, our mm. point of view. But of course, we could be more active and uh, we could be more clear on our positions uh, also from the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. If you look at the Swedish media debate, for example, uh, sometimes it's highlighted that specific individuals from, from the business sector are questioning, is climate change really happening? Mm. And I mean, we could be more clear on that. We actually take this question very seriously mm. and we're actually trying to work with it. And I know also that a lot of companies are actually putting climate issues into their strategies. So. I think there is a lot of things mm. happening, but maybe it, it's not uh, visible enough uh, for the big audience. But, but I mean, if I then ask, I, I normally don't ask very nasty questions, but if I ask a bit nasty question, if you then say it's so important and you argue from the confederation, confederation side that it's so important, why, why are you alone? Why, why do you only have one person? <laughs> I, know, I know your capacity. I <laughs> well, know you have to ask five. my boss about that. Yes, but but, what, what but I, we, we only have one person on each issue, rather. Ah. So, so, I mean, I don't think it's uh, just this area. You could argue the same thing for a lot of other areas. Okay. <laughs> That's good. That's good enough. I just wanted to, you know, push you a little bit on that one. Um, of course, you know, we believe that you should be at least five, uh, with you as the head, of course. Uh, Thank you. I'll, I'll tell them that. That's good, yes. Birgitta Resvik. You are, I mean, we, we, we have two corporate representatives from, from individual companies here, and, and you are in a way a little bit on the upstream side, you can say. I mean, you represent the energy sector, you know, one of the corporations we are hoping will look into mitigation a lot. What is, what is your perspective? Do you feel you have enough knowledge to know when you plan your business for as Fortune, the future, do you know enough to s incorporate that? Yes, actions. yes, definitely. And I would say that um, this is uh, really embedded in our corporate strategy. And I would say that this is uh, the top management team uh, and the board, everybody is really behind. We believe that uh, there is a need to go for, for a, a more efficiency and also for a more renewable, or we call it a solar economy. Mm. That is, that is on, on the long term. But of course, uh, and also then we have to have a vision, what do we believe about prices on, on, on finite resources? And uh, we believe on the long term, yes, it will be higher prices. Mm. So that's why it's good to invest in, in, in uh, other sources as well. But of course, this is uh, a timeline that is quite long for an energy company. We have assets when we build something, it's, it's for 50 years mm. in, or 80 years. So we have to really have a, a long-term vision. Mm. And uh, of course, we are then stuck with some of the assets that we have. And of course, we, want to, we need to use them. Mm. And as but then we try to transform to get in more bio in, into some of the assets and, and instead of fossils. But this is uh, a journey, I would say. Mm. You can't change it overnight. But uh, I would definitely say that this is on the top of our mind. And uh, we are uh, investing mostly, I would say, in, in carbon-free sources. Mm. We are, though, in Russia, and there at the moment, there are no possibilities with economic to, to invest in other things than, than gas, but mm. we are doing it with a high efficiency uh, CHP, or carbon, uh, combined heat and power. So we are doing it really on, 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 the, on the top of the class. But of course, this is happening things there as well. But we need to go hand in hand with the politics. Mm. And we need to have uh, price on carbon. Yeah, I mean, if you take that, in, and if you if we look a little bit outside Fortum and at the sector as such, uh, a few years back when we had the financial crisis, there was a lot of discussions that this was an opportunity really for investments in, in new forms of energy, renewable energy, etc. And then now, looking today, globally, not I don't talk about Fortum, we see hydrological fracking, we see, you know, push for for drilling for oil for oil in the Arctic and and so on. Coming from the energy sector, wh what do you think the thinking is there in your sector? Yeah, but that, that's why I say we have to have a view of the long-term price horizon. Mm. We can, of course, look into that at the moment today, uh, but we need to have that focus. And, of course, we have to look at different sources, and, and of course, we, we have to acknowledge what's, what's happening. But that's why it's so important that we also have a, a, a view of that we believe that 
uh, there will be a price in carbon and that we can see also things happening around the world. I would say uh, you can be very pos uh, pessimistic, but you can also be quite positive to some s things that are happening, but it will take time. But I think that's why it's so important to have this type of discussions. Mm. So clear economic signals in s are key for you. Um, and, and as representing Fortum again, you would be happy to see clear economic sort of political signals that would actually make, for instance, uh, fracking uh, history rather than the future? Well, w I don't have any comment about that. I mean, uh, I see we buy uh, sources, but I mean, of course, it, it's dependent on, on the prices. But we like to see that, and I think that's why we are engaged in, in uh, a lot in, in uh, R&D and, and trying to get down the cost of, of new and alternative technologies. Mm. We are in wave technology, we're in solar, we're in others to really see the, the possibilities. And we have to look into storage and things like that. We have to be very open-minded mm. to how we can form the new energy system. Excellent. Thank you very much. Huh? May I take a stand at it? Yes, and you absolutely. And also because H&M, of course, from look, you know, the, the, the presentation we heard about supply chain and understanding that, that is also very key for you. So it will be interesting to get your perspective. Um, and a stab thanks. on this. Yeah, well, it's just that I, uh, going all the way back to the beginning, I guess I would say that, yes, businesses can do, can act, should act, no question about it. And I guess things that I've seen from this, uh, the previous presentations seem extremely familiar to me. I absolutely recognize that, um, you know, that companies do, there's, there's a certain amount that, that we act when it comes to uh, sustainability or climate change that is just comes from uh, the ethics, ethical mm. questions. Or this is what we want to stand for, and we invest in this or bear this cost because it's the right thing to do. It's what we want to do. And then there's the part that's uh, seizing, doing what business does best, which is seizing opportunities and, 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 and addressing risks. Um, and that's hard, I guess, uh, is, 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 is one of the reasons that maybe it's, it's definitely not moving fast enough. Um, but, uh, you know, so the question of are we getting the right information or, or is there... Do, yeah. we, do you need to know more? That's do we need to know more? Uh, I don't know if we need to know more, but the... the I'm encouraged by what I heard um, uh, from uh, about the, this coming, uh, what is it, the working group two, yeah. that the, some of the adaptations to help simplify, to make it easier language, more usable by businesses. Because the translation from the science to how can I apply mm -hmm. this into my facility here, to mitigating the risk here in my business, uh, seizing that opportunity, is difficult work. We've all gone through the, um, not all of us, but we have gone through the operation of looking at where the hotspots are in our own operation, the climate hotspots in our own operations in the, along mm. the supply chain, addressing those sort of mitigation, how can we address where our impacts are, and then the next step is also the, mm. the resilience of the supply chain um, from a risk and opportunity perspective. Um, and having more adapted information will certainly be will certainly be helpful. Um, not to, in any way, abdicate responsibility, but I'm also encouraged by, sort of, uh, well, I guess it's organizations like like uh, Stockholm Environment Institute or World Resources Institute that help with that translation mm -hmm. sometimes with risk filters that you can use. So, <laughs> but but if, if I can ask you a concrete example, I think you know it's very fascinating uh, that HMM. Or you know you have a strategy, if I understand correctly, and I'm probably simplifying here, but you will move quite a lot of the production to Ethiopia. Uh, at least you have a lot of investments in Ethiopia. When you take that sort of business decision, which is a quite big decision to move from our perspective into a region where you have major issues with water supply, you know, variable climate and so on, regardless of climate change, um, how much has climate been part of that business decision? How much do you discuss? the climate perspectives when you make such a decision? Well, sustainability questions, both from a social standpoint, environmental standpoint, figure into those types of, uh, uh, you know, 
I guess it's expansion mm. plans. They absolutely do. Um, we work with, uh, um, you know, we have, th there's the, a lot of people say that, well, if climate is the shark, then water is the teeth uh, coming to get us. We have uh, engaged in a, in a uh, water strategy with WWF that goes across our, our, mm. our operations and into the supply chain. So the answer is yes, it, it, it figures in. It does. Okay, so ha do you know of any sort of case when you're looking at investments where, where the lack of knowledge, for instance, related to climate change or the risk perspe you know, perspective has, has actually stopped you from making investments? Or I if, if that is anything for you as well from Fortune? I don't know. Okay. I just don't know. Use the microphone. There is a little microphone on the side. No, on the side of the chair. On the side of the chair. <laughs> Sit down and then <laughs> here, here. Yes. Is the residual city and culture controlling environmental attitude and passive attitude for a possible concept of a champion? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the what concept. Uh, the future city and culture. Is that uh. a possible concept for HML? We are talking about climate, talking about the environment, talking about passive control. It's a very specific concept. Yeah, I'm not I, I apologize. I, I'm not familiar with it. You can uh. discuss it together during the break. Uh. So because what I would like to ask you, though, uh, I mean, Mons, I gave him the, the sort of opportunity to uh, respond. How can we from the scientific community be better at trying to address the, the realities of the corporate sector. From your respective areas, you represent a big uh, corporation with a, lot, you know, a very complex supply chain. You operate all over the world. The energy sector, wider, uh, of course, with different strategies in different companies, but still. And Maria, the confederation, really the broad base. W looking ahead, wha what are the sort of scientific questions that you s see from your respective areas? And then I will ask Mons, of course, to respond. You. Wh what is it that you need help with? What do you see as fundamental questions still for you to take further action? <laughs> well, you know, you have a chance to give a wish list here to, to Mons and the wider research community. Any, any, anything in particular? I would like to know when, when to buy which stocks and... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think, um, I think um, policy instrument and, and trying how, how can we go forward for, for uh, of course the global pricing of, of carbon that, that's one how do we how can we assess that in, in, a, in the different uh, countries and in different regions and, and try to get a trustworthy system because I think that is uh, so essential then of course I mean we're looking into new technologies and so on mm. and, and then we have the, the risk assessment I think there we are doing this very thoroughly, but of course I think we need more help for mm. that. And um, then we're working with adaptation. I mean, we are investing heavily now in, in, <coughs> in the dams and, and dam, dam safety and so on, because adaptation is already here. We are working with that. Uh, and of course that is also analyzes to do uh, more. But um, I would say the policy is, is, the, is the way forward. Otherwise it will never happen. Mm. Mm. Maria, what do you see? Uh, well, I, I still think that sort of reaching this global climate framework, even if it was said here earlier that, that maybe you turned away from that belief that we have ever will get that, I still think that actually having a global framework, uh, I rather call it framework than a single agreement, is a very important thing. And all sort of policy research that could help that process, I think it's very important. Mm. Another thing uh, is also that we, we actually have some... I mean, some processes or, um, well, industries that actually don't yet see how they're going to solve their climate problems. Mm. I mean, if you look at the energy sector, they have a lot of alternatives. So they are quite lucky. But there are other processes, steel manufacturing, uh, et cetera, which has problems. And, and they need research in order to actually be able to manage their emissions. So I, I think that's two areas that would be very important for more research. Okay, that's very specific. Dov, I, I won't get, you know, you're trying to get off the hook here <laughs> too quickly, I think. 
still, I mean, you represent a, a co company working really globally, and in particular with a lot of supply chains in countries, I would argue, are facing a lot of climate challenges, uh, where you can play a very positive role. But what kind of support do you need in, in your business strategy development for the future that you, from the scientific community? Well, I think I would, well, I'd first like to echo what I just heard, because I think that if you, I mean, I don't know exactly how much we can expect in terms of uh, further or more detailed information from, from science. Mm -hmm. um, and we are literally trying to predict the weather. Um, but what we can get from science that feeds into policy, which can then send signals to business, um, is, extremely, okay. uh, is extremely important. Um, yeah, that would be the probably the main hope for me as well. Thank you. No, I think that's, that's a very interesting point. It's actually, again, you know, making this policy influence. Mons, what is your take on this? Focusing on policy, focusing on policy change, make you know the, the rules of the game, really. That's where the main impact could be. Yeah, we, we, um, we're struggling with this, of course. And, um, but <coughs> there might be sense that uh, the, the overall frame of a global carbon price as a driver of uh, an even playing field uh, is a bit utopian. Mm. And we may have to look at other policies and other ways of reaching uh, a transition pathway. And I think there's a lot of, there's a big need to work on policy instruments and understanding in a more specific way how instruments work on markets mm. and also how they interact with other instruments. Mm. So because policies are clusters mm. trying to achieve many different things. So, so understanding, for instance, how energy security policies and climate policies and air quality policies are changing market dynamics in specific contexts. And, and uh, these interactions are not well understood, mm. uh, either by policymakers that decide on them or by businesses who have to <laughs> live with them. Mm. So it be becomes a kind of unpredictable world mm. in that sense. And that, I think, is hampering the willingness to invest Thank you. And sometimes conflicting goals and targets. Dov, you wanted to have a final word there. I just wanted to, to make sure you don't think I'm trying to get off the hook. No. I, wanted, <laughs> I want to sort of make it clear uh, that my, my expectations from science are, as, uh, as I said before, uh, but that uh, you know, building the resilience in my supply chain, uh, my supply chain, I wish, um, is, you know, that's... I'll take all the help that I can get. The information is is absolutely helpful, but uh, I guess that's. I don't. Ex I don't think that's science's responsibility to build resilience into my supply chain. No, the building of resilience is yours. I agree. Yeah. But you must have the data and the information and the yeah, exactly. So great. Thank you very much. A short panel discussion, but really very interesting for us and and feeding into the group discussions we are going to have as well. So a warm thank you to all four and applaud. So we are now going to move into this very interesting, I'm sure, and challenging discussion where you now will bring in all these different questions and points and whatever you have uh, picked up during this very intensive introductory part. So I would like to ask now Per Klevnes, where are you Per? Yes. Um, who is a senior project manager at the Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, welcome up to stage. And Alda Sigurdardottir, where are you Alda? Ah, there you are. So tell us. What's going to happen now? How are we going to do this? The floor is yours. Very good. I'll, I'll make a start. So um, thank you all. Uh, we're going to split into groups, and I'll let Alda deal with the logistics of it. And I just want to provide a little bit of framing to the question that you will have put in front of you um, as you go into these groups. And the question is the following. Given the range of global uncertainties around investments, regulations, and climate, what changes have to happen to give business leaders and investors the confidence to make big bets on climate action? Now, tall order, and very much the topic of discussion that we just had here. And I wanted to, to give a, few, a little bit of context. Uh, first off, I think that by the, the, the wording big bet is, is a shorthand for something that, that really has been the theme suffusing a lot of what we heard here, or making 
the actions that we see ne as necessary um, for, for the transition to lower emissions and to, uh, to more resilience, um, part of a core decision-making pro process. Make it a groundswell rather than something that floats on top. And so to think of that, uh, in, in, that in those sort of words. And I think, I think the broader context here is that I think on some level, science has helped a great deal, if you like. Um, we have scenarios and trajectories for changing our sources of energy, for greater resource productivity and its possibilities, for a new set of infrastructure, and also for a set new set of institutions, the investments that are needed to bring this forward. We also have some messages about the limited cost, potentially, of taking these actions, as well as the last large cost of inaction sometime in the future. What we don't necessarily have is the connection between those and what is on your next meeting agenda. And to think about the, the current decisions that you face and ask yourself perhaps not so much what have we done, but what have we not done? What were the decisions that we could have taken but that we did not take because something was missing? And I think we'd set this also in the context not just of policy. I think policy, we all recognize, is, is absolutely key. But let me at least put very briefly to you a, a slightly different story, um, which may or may not prove right, that we are seeing that a successful economy of the future, and therefore a successful collection of companies producing in that economy, may be one where the clever use of and the good use of technology and the early adoption of technology and of strong innovation is a core constituent part. And we've seen energy technology come down in price spectacularly, whether it's solar, whether it's batteries, whether it's, uh, wh whether it's lighting and, and across a range of, of fields, bringing it into the solution space that really is within the gr grasp of ordinary business decisions regardless of policy. Other technologies such as 3D printing, maybe it's 10 years out, but nonetheless would have enormous implications that are not often understood for, uh, for product the productivity with which we use resources all plays into our discussion, but comes from a completely different direction. Similarly, the idea of resource scarcity and resource productivity operates on a logic that, regardless of policy, we are facing significant constraints as a very large number of people are increasing their consumption. And here, let me put it again then, that maybe the successful economy of the future is one that is resource productive, um, that uses resources in a good way, and not just energy efficient, but across the various things that we've heard this morning. Now, policy, of course, is also part of, part of the picture. But I wanted to just open up the space a little bit. When you think of climate action, again, the things you didn't do, what was missing, and to have that discussion. We, of course, find this tremendously useful to direct what we, what we think of as SEI and the wider research community. But I think also in terms of, um, we hope that you, you will find it useful. We will report back in the afternoon in our panel, and also after this meeting, we will we'll report back to try and, and give our collective wisdom on this area um, as well. So I hope that provides a bit of framing, and uh, I hope you have a very productive time in the group discussions. Hello, my name is Alta. I come from Iceland. Uh, I've been training the table leaders that will lead you in this discussion. I could talk for the whole day about these methods, but I'm going to save time about that. So if anyone wants to ask me, I, I can meet them in the coffee break and give them some information. But just to give you some idea, uh, we have used this uh, method in Iceland since 2009. It started after the crash, where we had 1,500 randomly picked up uh, Icelanders to define the value of the nations and actions, and it had major impact on politics, politics decisions, et cetera, et cetera. So this method we're using has been used for the government, but originally it was from a group called the ants, you know, ants, it was bottom-up ideology. But this, been this method has been used in over 100 uh, times in Iceland since 2009. We have done it for institutions, uh, private companies, uh, government, etc. So it's, we think it's bulletproof and we have seen some results from it, um, both from more research about certain topics, but also uh, a paper that had been delivered to the government, to the prime minister. So all kind of summaries comes out of this. So I really look forward to, to uh, what you do this. And I would like to just jump in and ask the table leaders and or the facilitators to come here so you see the faces. You have already been uh, separated in groups and you can see on your 
name tag, which group you're in. And uh, so number one is Magnus Bensi, which is over there. He's a group number one. And you will be following him in Wallenbergs for Aiken, which is just here out of the room to left. Really nice sofa area. Uh, Jakob Granit, who is over there, he will take you to Gabriel Larsson Sweden. And uh, maybe you should all meet him at the stairs because it's a little journey there. Also, Amber Nicholson, she's leading group number three. She's actually going to just the next room to Jakob, so you should follow them. Uh, Gregor Vulturius, there he is, number four. He is going to be in the Nobel Rimlet, which is also on the next floor. Not the next floor, the other one. Second next floor. <laughs> Carl Halting, which is there, leading group number five. Banquet Salem Salon 1, which is where we had the lunch. So it's easy to find that. Uh, Marion Davis. There. Oh, there you are. And she's also going to be in the Banquet Salon Salon. And she's leading the group number six. Number seven is Maria Yurisu. And she's also going to be there in Banquet Salon Salon. Per Klevnas. Hanskal Vera i, oh, this is Scandinavian. Oh, Baxel <laughs> Rimmet, some air hair, which is just here. <laughs> um, Richard Klein, over there, number, leading group number nine. Leta Mot Rimmet, that is where the chair members are, you know, meeting. So, uh, it's also on the second next floor. Oscar Valgren, he will be in Stora for Ayen. It's just next floor, uh, the table over there. So I want you to give these great table leaders that I've trained and they are excellent. They are uh, really uh, re uh, have a lot of experience. I want to give them applause in forehand, please. Hey. Table leaders, you can hear there's a lot of expectations. Good luck. But say also that we must be back in time. Yeah. One, one final thing. We must be back in time in this room uh, because we have a presentation by Peter Nurman, so we have to start on time, okay? Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's